Southwest has been conse profitable consecutively for 42 years. Again, in an industry where the norm is bankruptcy, they're profitable. In fact, even in the horrible year, horrible in many respects, but particularly financially for the airlines of 2001, their profit was down, but they still were profitable in 2001, a year that wiped out as several airlines filed bankruptcy. So let's go to th think about them as a really interesting example. First of all, they have a really clear strategy. Their strategy has been provide a low, um, it's starting to, they're, li they're a little challenged by this, something we can, we can talk about in a minute, but basically for, for most of the last 42 years, their strategy is provide a low cost, more convenient alternative to travel between mid-sized cities that are about 500 to 1,000 miles apart, right? Now, and, and basically their competition historically has been cars, trains, buses, and hub and spoke flights. So if you wanted to go from you know, Manchester, New Hampshire to Baltimore, uh, you either could, you know, what are your alternatives? You can drive, it's a long drive, you can take a train, it's, it's a bit inconvenient, you can take a bus, which is really inconvenient. You could fly, but most airlines you had to fly, you'd fly through, you'd say you'd probably fly like Manchester to Chicago, and then Chicago over to Baltimore, you might take Delta, you would take all day, right? Um, and so they said, let's fly point to point. Let's find those cities and fly point to point, because that's more convenient. People actually rather fly point to point. But we want to keep it relatively cheap. Now, that's a that's an hard strategy to pull off. And because you ask yourself, why didn't other airlines do that? And the reason that's a really hard strategy to pull off is, is a combination of airplanes are expensive and they depreciate rapidly. And the problem is if you fly short hauls to cities that aren't particularly big, you have a utilization problem. You have this very expensive asset that spends a lot of time, not much time flying, right, but a lot of time on the ground, and you're not going to, and, and if your strategy is convenience, you want to fly a lot of flights. You don't want to do one flight a day from, say, Manchester, New Hampshire to Baltimore. You want to do seven flights. Well, those aren't big cities, right? So now you really have a utilization problem and you got all this expensive capital. That's why everybody else did kind of hub and spoke. We batch you up, we take you from places like Manchester and Providence uh, and Syracuse, and we fly you into Chicago, um, and then we kind of redistribute you. We can make better use of our capital. But they changed the economics of the business through their operations strategy, which is they, they focused very heavily on the turnaround time. So if you looked at the airline industry, the average time it takes to turn around a plane from the time it goes into a gate to the time it goes out is 40 minutes. Now 40 minutes, is, if you think about it, is that a long time? Well, it depends. If you're Singapore Airlines, the average flight length on Singapore Airlines is uh, seven and a half hours. So 40 minutes is not a long time for that piece of capital to be on the ground before it gets up and flies uh, to another location. If your average flight length, which, which for uh, 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 Southwest is about an hour and a half, 40 minutes is a long time, right? I mean, you wipe out, you've just wiped out 30% of your utilization of the asset right there. And then not, not every seat is filled, so you're losing more utilization. But by reducing the turnaround time, they reduced their turnaround time to 20 minutes. That was a core part of their strategy. And so by doing it, if you think about over about seven flights a day that you get on that kind of length, you get one extra flight per day, right? Because it, it, you're kind of picking up about 20 minutes per, and by the end of the day, you've got enough time to get in one more flight. Now, that's a completely fixed asset. An airplane is, once you've bought the airplane, it's depreciating, and yet the only marginal cost of a flight is the fuel, which is about 12% uh, of the total operating cost. Uh, the crew is salary. They're there, basically, anyway. I mean, there's not a lot of marginal cost. It's, it's a fixed asset, those seats are sitting there. If you get one extra flight per day, all that revenue goes straight to the bottom of the line. When I teach this case with my MBAs, you can show their entire profitability, year after year, is in that one extra flight per day per plane. That's why they're profitable. It, you can actually trace it right to that. One extra flight per day per plane is the difference between being very profitable and not being profitable at all. Now, how do they do that? Because it's one thing to say, yeah, our strategy is turnaround time. How do you execute that? How do you execute that? Well, at Southwest, it's through a whole system of choices. Quick turn occurs not because of one decision, 
because of about 20 things they do that are all focused on quick turn. So everybody knows it's the sign over the door says quick turn, right? So no meals, no pre-assigned seating historically. That's starting to change, but you know, you have an incentive to get there early. Unless you like middle seats, people get there. Um, um, very, um, uh, you know, the whole idea of a standard 737 platform. You have one turnaround script. Everybody knows how to turn around one of those planes. You don't have to worry about is it, you know, because actually it turns out that loading luggage on planes, and I've done some case studies in this industry, they vary dramatically by plane. Um, so everything is scripted. They've created a culture where if, as a worker on the tarmac, if you come up with an idea that you think will save 15 seconds from the turnaround time, you put it into a suggestion box, it's vigorously analyzed, looked at, experimented, and then they roll it out. So continual improvement, a lot of things they do. Um, you've probably seen their baggage ads, right? They're those wonderful ads, what, we love your bags, why would we charge for them? You know, and the big burly baggage handlers are teary-eyed as they're waving, and you say, why are they doing that? Why, why don't they charge for bags? Everybody else is charging for bags. And in fact, if you think about it, it, it you, could, you, could, you could give lower fares and charge for bags. And some people would be better off financially, right? I typically don't travel with a bag, so I'd rather get a lower price and let other people pay for their bags. But think about, now reflect, what was the last time you were on an airplane, what took the longest in the process to load the airplane? Yeah, it's people shoving their bags in the overhead. If you've ever been on, uh, I was once flying out of London about eight years ago when there was a, for security reasons, you were not allowed to bring any carry-on. I don't know if anybody had that experience. It was about a week or two. Uh, and I got on a 747, and it, it turns out it takes about five minutes to load a 747 if nobody has any bags. I mean, think about it. You just get on, you walk, you, you walk on the plane, you sit down, that's it. It's 300 people can do that in about, in about five minutes. But if you take those 300 people and each give them bags, and, and as we know, some bags are big, right? And, and then they have to take them off. That kills turnaround. Now, for a lot of airlines, that's not a big deal. But if you're Southwest, the clock's ticking. So it's a great example where, do you think that's a decision made by the CEO at Southwest? Do you think the CEO is masterminding all that? Absolutely not. CEO's got other things to do. There's probably somebody who's in charge of baggage policy, like the vice president of baggage policy, right? And that's their job, to think about baggage policy. Now, it would be very easy for somebody, I'm sure somebody someplace did a spreadsheet that showed how much extra revenue you could get by charging for bags. Like 60 bucks a bag, we have this many bags, that's going to be great. That's where strategy comes into play. If you've got a strategy, you understand right off the bat, before you even look at the numbers, whether that makes sense or not. Southwest strategy is turnaround. So everything is filtered against, does this help us with turnaround or does it hurt us with turnaround? And they're, they kind of come up with that decision because they think it helps them with turnaround. So it doesn't, good strategy enables folks to do things without asking everybody else. Right, in general, and good operation strategies do that because again, these are all decisions that have to get made in lots of different parts of the organization. Okay, so that's a kind of high level view as to what operation strategy, the essence of what operation strategy is about.